<laughs> Y'all, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you all for being here tonight. Those in this magnificent building, as though, well as those watching from afar. I can promise you there's not any place on earth that I would rather be than right here, right now, with you. I promise. <laughs> One reason is because I am proud of the state of South Carolina. And I'm also proud of my family. For those of you who may not have met him, let me introduce some of my family. My wife, Peggy, and my son, Henry, and his wife, Virginia, up. If y'all will please stand and be recognized. Y'all, thank you. Our daughter, Mary Rogers, is not here tonight. She is watching from New York with her fiance, Samuel Martin Herskovitz. The big date, March 16th. Write it down. <laughs> we have, one year ago, I observed here that we were at the dawn of a new prosperity, that our future would be even better than our past. Tonight, as we all know, that is true. The state of our state is strong and getting even stronger. We live in a land of opportunity and over the generations, over the generations, we have built institutions of opportunity for the people of our state. Our goals today must be to reinvigorate and accelerate those institutions and rededicate ourselves to achieving the prosperity which can be ours. We have a strong state because we are a strong people. Strong people, a family, a state, a nation is only as strong as its people. Our strength is an economic issue and also an issue of national security. In a rapidly changing world, a highly competitive and dangerous world, we must be constantly making our people strong, educated, trained, healthy, happy, as I speak tonight, I'd like to recognize a few people, a few of our strong people, leaders who have made a difference in our lives. Some are here, some are not. I start with the six in uniform who lost their lives while protecting ours. Deputy Shannon Dale Hallman of the Saluda County Sheriff's Office. Deputy James L. Kirk, Jr. of the Lancaster County Sheriff's Office. Sergeant Terrence F. Carraway of the Florence Police Department. Deputy Farrah B. Turner of the Florence County Sheriff's Office. Assistant Fire Chief Dennis Charles Strait of the Charlotte Road Van Wick Volunteer Fire Department in Lancaster County. And Sergeant First Class Christopher A. Salise, United States Army lost his life in Paktia Province, Afghanistan in support of Operation Freedom, Freedom's Sentinel. To the families and loved ones of these men and women, on behalf of all South Carolinians, we send you love, admiration, and strength, and we thank you for your loved one's service and sacrifice. You are in our prayers. I'd also like to thank Dr. Harris Pastides, who is retiring after 10 years of remarkable leadership and accomplishment at the University of South Carolina. And he's with us tonight with his wife, Pat uh, Patricia. Will you please stand and be recognized, Dr. and Ms. Pastides. Not with us tonight is Dr. Andrew Sue, whom we welcome as the new president of the College of Charleston. 
He has called this position his American dream. And also I'd like to congratulate Clemson University on winning their third national championship. In many different ways, all of these men and women have added to the strength and prosperity of our state. I have one brand new face for you tonight, Lieutenant Governor Pamela Evitt of Traveler's Rest with her husband David and their son Jackson. Thank you, Pamela, for accepting the call to serve our fellow citizens. Pamela, please stand and be recognized. And David. Ladies and gentlemen, I can promise you that South Carolina is red hot. Our agricultural base is accelerating, our tourism industry is thriving, and we have become a major high-tech manufacturing hub in this country. South Carolina is the nation's top exporter of tires and of completed automobiles. Our average annual manufacturing employment growth is 16%, which is the highest in the Southeast. Over and over, we are recognized as one of the best places in the country to do business and to visit or vacation. In the last two years, we've announced over $8 billion in new capital investment and more than 27,000 new jobs. Our employment rate just hit an all-time low. More people are working here now than ever before. In the past year, we've welcomed many new businesses to South Carolina and celebrated the growth and expansions with those who already call our great state home. Some of them are here with us tonight. I'd like to recognize them and ask them to stand. We'll recognize them as a group. Recognizing W International, Mr. Ed Walker and Ms. Michelle Fowler, if you would please stand. Representing Kent in, and remain standing. Representing Kent International, Mr. Arnold Kamler and Mr. Scott Kamler. Representing Drox Mayor Group, Mr. Bradley Nelson and Mr. Chip Vogel. Representing Curry Dr. Pepper, Mr. Randy Downing and Ms. Pam Daskalakis. Representing Sunoco, Mr. Rob T.D. and Mr. Roger Schrum. Representing Google, Mr. Paul Karth. Representing Roundport Mortgage, Mr. Kevin Brungart. Ladies and gentlemen, we welcome you to this historic State House. We are glad you're here. Ladies and gentlemen, did you notice at the inauguration ceremony two weeks ago, on the steps, in addition to the display of the leadership of, leadership of our academic institutions, the presence of 27 diplomats from 22 countries. They were there. These visitors are here for one reason, commerce, commerce, investment and prosperity. They see that we in this state are on the way up in this country. They know that we have recognized and are harnessing the catalytic power of the collaborations between and among business and industry and academia. In a word, it is called brain power. Brain power produces commercial horsepower, and that horsepower drives our economic prosperity. Ladies and gentlemen, we in South Carolina are players in the greatest economic competition the world has ever seen. We must be bold, aggressive, and think long term. We must keep the people and institutions of South Carolina leading in this competition. It has taken years to get to where we are, but we must do more. 
That means some things. That means we must keep taxes low. We must reduce burdensome regulations and we must invest heavily in infrastructure. We now have the highest marginal income tax rate in the Southeast, the 12th highest in the nation. That's too high. Seven states have no income tax at all. Taxes of all kinds at all levels add up little by little to smother economic growth. Beating the competition today requires reforming our state's marginal income and corporate tax rates. That's why I have proposed a $2.2 billion tax cut across all personal income brackets, which would result in an average 15% rate reduction. And that is why I commend the House and Senate for embarking on a comprehensive effort to reform our state's tax structure. Working together, I am certain that we will succeed and keep South Carolina winning. <laughs> this year, our vigorous economy created a budget surplus. My executive budget sends $20 million of this surplus back to the South Carolina taxpayers in the form of a one-time rebate check. They earned the money. Surpluses don't mean we have to spend it all. A surplus allows us to prioritize the most critical needs in state government and then return the rest to the taxpayers. We should commit to returning taxpayers back, tax dollars back to our state's businesses at every opportunity. Last year, I issued a $52 million cut to the unemployment insurance taxes paid by our state's employers. This was made possible by the leadership and work done by many of the people in this room tonight to reform and rebuild our state's trust fund. The time has come to redouble our commitment to our state's men and women in uniform. Veterans, first responders, law officers, firefighters, and peace officers through a full retirement income exemption. The exemption for veterans is a key factor in the Pentagon's decision on protecting and expanding a state's military bases, of which we have eight, and expanding and bringing new missions and troops to our bases. It is also an effective incentive to keep experienced law officers, firefighters, and first responders on the job. We are now another year into an ongoing state retirement pension crisis. Our unfunded liability threatens to place unprecedented strain on state government if we do not take action soon. Retired, current, and future public employees must have a pathway to retirement income security with future benefits and costs that are both sustainable and predictable. Doing nothing now threatens our commitment. We must work. We must do it. It's a fact, ladies and gentlemen, that we have some of the strongest people in the country in education in South Carolina. For example, in 2001, Dr. Sharon Budden of Ridgeview High School, and then in 2009, the late Lucy Beckham of Wando High School were named National Principal of the Year. Last year was Dr. Akil Ross of Chapin High School. He was here. This year we celebrate again with Dr. Lucas C. Clamp of River Bluff High School being recognized as the National Principal of the Year. They're not able to be with us tonight, but we thank them for exemplifying the greatness of South Carolina. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we are building an international reputation for business growth and progress. You saw that with the diplomats. Being perceived as weak in any part of our state, including in education, is not good. 
but being perceived as not committed to fixing it is a disaster. Not long ago, I had a conversation with a fascinating woman, Dr. Wanda Andrews, the superintendent of the Lee County School District, a rural county. Education suffers there. You've been there. Once grown, children leave, only returning for maybe a family reunion or a homecoming football game. I asked Dr. Andrews not long ago what would happen if a new manufacturing plant offering 500 or so jobs were to come to her school district. I wish you could have seen it. Dr. Andrews set down her yellow sharpened number two pencil, took off her glasses and said, and I quote, it would change everything. <laughs> Dr. Andrews. Dr. Andrews, that is exactly what we are going to do. We are going to change everything. Mark my words, the words corridor of shame will soon be a distant memory. Dr. Andrews, stand up, let us recognize you again. This is going to require work. It will require a state-backed economic development commitment to bring jobs to these districts by providing infrastructure in rural areas, not only in water, sewer, and roads, but in school buildings and facilities. School buildings and facilities. We must provide the spark in those school districts. My executive budget creates the Rural School District Economic Development Closing Fund. This fund will provide $100 million for our Department of Commerce to use as a closing fund to bring new jobs and investment to our poorest school districts. We must also invest in our teachers to attract and retain the best, their compensation must be competitive with their peers in the Southeast and elsewhere. My executive budget calls for a 5% teacher pay raise totaling $155 million. This will increase average teacher salaries in South Carolina above the Southeast average. And now's the time, but we can't stop there. The primary funding formula for public education, as you know, the Education Finance Act was established about 40 years ago. That and those formula that have followed have become outdated, inefficient, and confusing. To say they are complex is an understatement. They fail to provide the accountability, efficiency, and transparency necessary for a modern means of measurement to determine if taxpayer dollars are being properly delivered and utilized in the classroom. Last week, Speaker Luskus and President Peel and I called on the State Revenue and Fiscal Affairs Office to objectively review South Carolina's complex education funding formulas and suggest a new, more efficient and modern funding model for the General Assembly to consider. Further, Speaker Lucas and Senator Greg Hembry will propose wholesale reforms to our education delivery system, eliminating burdensome testing, consolidating school districts, 
replacing non-productive school boards and reining in the practice of social promotions in our classrooms. I support the speaker and the senator 100%. Send me these reforms and I will sign them into law. But we can't stop there either. Our classrooms and schools must also be safe, free from distraction and violence. It's a fact. The presence of a trained, certified law enforcement officer is the best and most effective deterrent against violence at a school. Local police officers or sheriff's deputies who serve as school resource officers are trained to spot assess and eliminate any potential threat. They train constantly. They immediately communicate and coordinate with local law enforcement. Last year, we held a school safety summit of law enforcement, educators, counselors, mental health professionals, parents, and students to address the rise of violence in our schools. Two recommendations were made over and over at that summit and afterwards. One was to, to place a school resource officer in every school. The second was to provide access to mental health professionals who can train educators to recognize the warning signs of violent behavior in their students before it happens. But some school districts can't afford such personnel. Therefore, my executive budget ensures that every public school in our state has a full-time trained law enforcement officer and access to a mental health counselor through the Department of Mental Health's School Services Program. And the time to act on this is now, not next year, now. For decades, every family's goal was for their children to go to college, which then meant a four-year degree. Higher education was and still is the key to success. But ladies and gentlemen, the industries have changed. The work has changed. The skills required in today's modern workplace require us to stay ahead of demand and adapt with rapid advancements in technology. Modern manufacturing plants and assembly lines have been transformed into intricate computerized environments driven by advanced robotics, artificial intelligence, and sophisticated logistical delivery systems which are designed to deliver finished products around the world from South Carolina. This economic prosperity can also be achieved today through two-year associate degrees and a multitude of certificates from our state's exemplary technical colleges. Our technical college, six, uh, 16 colleges, established in 1961, is the best in the country. Last year, our Ready SC program trained over 3,600 people for 82 different companies. It is known around the world. My budget also triples existing funding for Ready SC, making more than $19 million available for training new employees for business in the next fiscal year. Right now, South Carolina has 60,000, count them, 60,000 highly paid jobs looking for people. High tech production, advanced manufacturing. They demand workers in the skilled trades plumbing, masonry, carpentry, and others, high paying job, jobs. Is the demand is so great that our businesses have to go out of state to recruit them. High school parents and their, stu high school students and their parents 
must be made aware that these new opportunities are readily available now. My executive budget prioritizes funding for our technical colleges to identify and recruit local businesses to participate in collaborative partnerships with high schools, to create internship opportunities, and to promote certificate completion. This will provide our local businesses with a pipeline of future employees who are ready to work. My budget also includes $63 million in additional dollars that are dedicated to workforce training and development. It triples new lottery funding for workforce scholarships and grants to help students attend our state's technical colleges. But even with this growth, the cost associated and debt associated with higher education is becoming a barrier for many students and their families. With 10 years of tuition and fee increases, student loan debt in South Carolina has risen by 315%. That is the highest in the country. I am proposing a one-year freeze on tuition and fees for in-state students at our public technical colleges, four-year colleges, and research universities for the 2019-2020 academic year. In exchange for freezing in-state tuition and fees to be certified by the Commission on Higher Education, institutions will receive a 6% increase in their annual base budget. That will be their pro rata share from a $36 million appropriation my budget makes to the Commission on Higher Education. I expect this one year tuition freeze not to be the end, but to serve as the first steps toward a comprehensive reform of higher education funding and tuition. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, our state's excellent institutions of higher education play a vital role in our state's economic prosperity. Their continued success is critical to keeping South Carolina competitive and winning. That's not all. We must also continue to invest in infrastructure. Infrastructure. Our ports, roads, and rail are critical components of our economic prosperity. In December, the South Carolina Ports Authority reported a 6.4 year over year container volume growth with a record 2.3 million units handled in 2018. That marked the third consecutive year of record volume when we're only getting stronger. The deepening of the Charleston Harbor is one of our most important steps to accelerate our future prosperity. Working with President Trump in his administration and with the assistance of Senator Graham and our congressional delegation, last year we secured an additional $49 million to keep the Charleston Harbor dredging project on schedule. There's more to come. And remember, this General Assembly wisely provided the first $300 million several years ago to guarantee the fulfillment of the project. Once this project is completed, Charleston, our port in Charleston, South Carolina, will have the deepest, most efficient harbor on the Atlantic, allowing post Panamax ships to carry even bigger loads in and out of South Carolina, spurring economic growth throughout the whole state. This is an enormous competitive advantage and to it we will add in the years ahead a revitalized port of Georgetown and a new port of Jasper.
Two men critical in this are Chairman Bill Stern and CEO Jim Newsom of the South Carolina Ports Authority. I thank them for their vision and dedication. Mr. Newsom couldn't be tonight, but Chairman Stern is here. I ask that he stand and be recognized. <laughs> and your wife, Linda, Ms. Stern. The fundamental purpose of government is to protect people and property. Today, we understand the many advantages of replacing recidivism with employment. We also know that more officers on the street mean less crime. My executive budget provides more than $33 million for law enforcement, corrections, probation, firefighting, and other criminal justice agencies to use for pay raises, retention bonuses, and hiring new officers. It also includes an additional $40 million to the Department of Corrections to expedite security system upgrades and modernization, as well as critical repairs to damaged prison facilities. Director Brian Sterling's focus on workforce readiness among inmates has resulted in South Carolina having one of the lowest recidivism rates in the country. More former inmates are re-entering their communities with a job than ever before in South Carolina. Our state is a safer place because of Director Sterling's leadership. He is one of the most innovative and effective directors of the prison systems in the United States. Brian Sterling, will you please stand and be recognized? Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the silent hurricane of opioid addiction continues to pummel the Palmetto State, just as nature's hurricanes do. The death toll from opioid-related overdosing continued to rise in 2017, with 748 opioid-related fatalities across South Carolina. There were just 57 in 2014. Last year, I declared a statewide public health emergency, mobilizing the full power of the state's emergency infrastructure in response to the growth of opioid addiction and abuse. And I signed what must be the most comprehensive set of laws in the country addressing this crisis across the spectrum of law enforcement, education, and health care produced by this General Assembly. For instance, our doctors are now required to educate minors and their families on the dangers of opioids before prescribing them. DHEC is issuing tamper-proof prescription pads. The anti-overdose drug Narcan is more readily available, and initial prescriptions are now limited to seven days. I also established the Opioid Emergency Response Team, which in June released a plan consisting of recommendations on physical and public education, prevention and response, treatment and recovery, and law enforcement approaches. Although there is still much to be done, this progress would not have happened without the leadership of our director of the Department of Alcohol and Other Drug Abuse Services, Director Sarah Goldsby. Please stand and be recognized. A healthy mind in a healthy body was a classical ideal. Today, it is another competitive advantage. Unfortunately, especially some of our rural areas, access to good health care is lacking. But fortunately, we know how to fix that. As always, education and knowledge are essential to progress. But so is the convenient access to health care professionals. This can be done in two ways, physical presence and virtual presence. We're doing both. Last year, I signed the law repealing the restriction, which required nurse practitioners to work only within 45 miles of their supervising physician. Now they can go anywhere. 
You're now seeing them in drugstores, rural clinics, and soon other convenient locations. <laughs> Virtual presence is accomplished by telehealth in which South Carolina leads the nation. We are the home of the Medical University of South Carolina, which is now designated a national telehealth center of excellence, only one of two in the country. This recognition would not have been achieved without the General Assembly investing and prioritizing innovation and optimization in the areas of stroke, obstetrics, mental health, and urgent care. So, through telehealth, we can expand access to health care. We can improve health care outcomes and reduce costs, and we will continue to do it. There's another kind of health which we must, frankly, must address, and that is the health of the public's confidence in their public servants and institutions. As we move forward together, we must reaffirm our commitment to good, honest government. As elected officials, we are stewards of the public trust. South Carolinians must trust their representatives and representatives must demonstrate that they are deserving of that trust. Maintaining the public's trust in government at all levels requires transparency and accountability on why and how every single taxpayer dollar is spent. The best disinfectant against waste and corruption is sunshine. That means stronger and expanded authority for the State Ethics Commission. Ladies and gentlemen, anyone paid to influence decisions by a state, county, municipal, or school board official must be required to publicly register with the State Ethics Commission as a lobbyist. Public officials must be required to recuse themselves when a conflict exists. And public officials in all branches of government, at all levels, must comply with the Freedom of Information Act. I ask my colleagues to take this fresh opportunity to bring all of government into the sunlight and restore and ensure the confidence of all. <laughs> South Carolina's bright economic future and continued job growth require an abundant supply of clean and affordable energy. Without it, we're at a competitive disadvantage. However, Santee Cooper is currently saddled with almost $9 billion, $9 billion in debt, over $4 billion of that debt from the failed VC Summer nuclear reaction construction project alone and with nothing to show for it. This huge debt will have to be paid. Santee Cooper will have no choice but to raise rates on customers to pay this debt. Their largest customer, the electric co-ops, will be required to pay 70% of it for the next 30 years. I am honored to serve on the committee with members of the House and Senate to present to you potential solutions concerning the future of, South Car of Santee Cooper. I ask that members of this General Assembly keep an open and objective mind when you receive this information. We must be deliberate and wise because the future of our economy is at stake. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this land, our land, is noted by the explorers many years ago for kings and queens is lush, fertile, brimming with abundance in plant and animal life. It is irreplaceable. The obligation and privilege of our generation and others is to use it, cultivate it, develop it, and also to protect it and encroach upon it only gently. Our economic growth and the preservation of our natural environment are not opposing objectives which must be balanced as in a competition one against the other. They are instead complementary, each dependent on these others. 
To these ends, I recently established the South Carolina Flood Water Commission. It's unique in the United States. There's not another one. This commission's purpose is to provide guidance, solutions, and opportunities presented by inland and coastal flooding and all that entails. Its scope will be global to be applied here in South Carolina. Such an extraordinary effort requires leadership. That's why I've asked another South Carolina leader to chair the commission. Noted attorney, former JAG officer, and current and former commander of the South Carolina State Guard, General Tom Mulliken. Please stand and be recognized, sir. Economic prosperity requires that we address water, water in a comprehensive fashion, whether it's flooding, sea rise, aquifer depletion, or upstream withdrawal. Make no mistake, a plentiful water supply is essential to our manufacturing, agricultural, and tourism industries, as well as to our quality of life. That means that we must stand firmly against all efforts to endanger the future of our pristine coastline, our beaches, our sea islands, our marshes, and our watersheds. Ladies and gentlemen, that means that we will not, that means that we will not have offshore testing or drilling off the coast of South Carolina. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> One final story about strong people. We got strong people all over South Carolina. I'm so proud of us. We have to let the children know to be proud of us, proud of themselves, proud of this state. For two and a half days last September, Hurricane Florence stormed across North and South Carolina battering the coast with hurricane force winds, storm surge, and massive amounts of rainfall. The winds were less than originally predicted by all the experts. The water, however, was many times worse. That rainfall sent almost biblical amounts of water racing into and onto South Carolina from the sky and from the rivers in North Carolina. Flooding created create catastrophic flooding all along the Lynch's, Lumbar, PD, Great PD, Little PD, and the Waccamaw Rivers, surpassing anything recorded in modern history in South Carolina. And it stayed there for weeks. Access to the Grand Strand, that whole section of Horry County, was threatened by historic rising floodwaters, poised to overtake, wash out, and destroy the roads and bridges into Myrtle Beach and the surrounding area, and they did. In addition, the threat of an environmental catastrophe was now on our doorstep with the certain overtopping of the closed Santee Cooper ash pond on the edge of the mighty Waccamaw in Conway. Thus began a remarkable feat of cooperation, engineering, science, hydrology, technology, and collaboration. Ladies and gentlemen, four foot tall barriers were built on both sides of US 501 at Conway, saving that vital highway from certain flooding and breach from which it would have taken months to recover. A four foot aqua dam was erected surrounding the eight acre ash ponds to keep potentially deadly coal ash and toxins from flowing into the Walker Mall River and the Winyah watershed all the way down to Georgetown and potential breaches along US 378 and State Highway 9 were blunted. Who did this? Who were the participants? They were the men and women of the Department of Transportation and the South Carolina National Guard. Ladies and gentlemen, Secretary Christy Hall and Major General Bob Livingston are here. Please stand and be recognized.
In closing, to my friends and colleagues in the General Assembly, many for many years, I can remember when some of us were children thinking about running for office, it seems. All of us in this building do not wear the same jerseys, but we're still all on the same team. We will work together to ensure that future generations of South Carolinians are able to keep winning and prospering. Now is the time to be bold, not bashful. Now is the time to act together this year, now, now, ladies and gentlemen. May God bless you. May God bless the great state of South Carolina. May God bless the great United States of America. Thank you.